The Ring of Berra, what to see if you only have one day, coming up. And we're jumping straight in with our first stop. This is Uruk Stone Circle in the Gleninchequin Valley. We started in Kenmare earlier this morning. About 20 minutes of a drive, you get your exit to the Gleninchequin Valley. And the Uruk Stone Circle is right there, about another 10 minutes. This is a few thousand year old stone circle, possibly the most beautifully located one in Ireland. As we are enjoying the beautiful surroundings of the Gleninchequin Valley, let's do a quick rundown of what today's trip and video are all about. First, the basics. So the Ring of Berra is a tourist route that follows the coast of the Berra Peninsula in southwest Ireland. It's about 80 to 140 kilometers long, really depending on the different roads that you can take. You can start in the little towns of Kenmare or Glengareth and do the ring either clockwise or anti-clockwise. We started in Kenmare and are also choosing to end the day there. So we'll be doing a little bit of a deviating route, but more on that later. For now, the most important thing to note is that just like with my Ring of Kerry in one day video, this is going to be an incredibly full day if you do all the stops that we are going to do. We're talking a 12 hour full kind of day. So keep that in mind. Of course, you do not have to do all of this in one day. Better yet, Berra really deserves much more time than that. You can easily spend two weeks on Berra and not get bored. So see what you like, mix and match, and just make your own adventure. And one last thing, most places that we visit are stops of about 5 to 20 minutes, except stops 1, 4 and 14. Those will take a little bit longer, with stop number 4 being Cashel Kilty being the longest. That's about one and a half hours worth of a hike. So that's good to know as you are progressing through your day. No matter how often I go to Oruk Stone Circle, it never ceases to amaze. Even if you're not that into archaeology or old, old stuff, highly recommend that you do check it out, make it part of your trip. And right at the end of the valley, where you can see the waterfall way in the back, that is Gleninchequin Park. If you have more than one day to spend on Barra, I highly recommend that you go and check out that place. It's fantastic hiking, beautiful scenery. It's just for today, we do not have enough time to go there. Still, keep it in mind. Okay, we're gonna do some driving. Next up, it's gonna be the coastal road, and that's how we get to Lorak. So we just took an exit from the main road of the Ring of Berra. Normally we would go up into uh, the mountains and pass over Lorak Pass, but we are taking the coastal road to Lorak. That's the R573. It's a far less busy road, far less touristy. The Ring of Berra, as opposed to the Ring of Kerry, is a little bit of a choose your own adventure, meaning there are far more little side roads that you can take to make that own adventure. And this is one of those side adventures that we're doing right now. Now, fear not, later on, oh, let me just let this good person pass. Later on during the day, when we drive back, we are still gonna go over Lorak Pass. So we are still gonna see it. But in this way, we see both the coastal road and the pass itself. For now, we're just gonna enjoy it. Stop number two is a quick one on the coastal road. This is Kilmakilog. It's a great little stop to quickly hop out of the car most tourists will miss this one. It's a nice little walk down to the harbor, to the water. Hop out of the car, enjoy. Looks like we picked the hottest day of the year to do this. Out of interest, Ring of Kerry or Ring of Berra? Which one do you like most? Can't choose. Can't choose? I'm gonna choose for you, Ring of Berra. <laughs> far less touristy, far more rural. And again, I do love the nature of Ring of Kerry. Okay, can't choose. <laughs> And we finally arrived in Lorak. This is stop number three. We're actually in Doreen Gardens as a place where we are snacking up, getting some coffee, some cakes, 
purely to get us ready for the next stop, which is going to be our most intensive one of the day. But that's for later for now. Like I said, we are in Doreen Gardens. This place by itself is fantastic if you have more than one day to explore. For today, we're just going to enjoy a cafe. Give yourself a little bit of a snack, maybe a late uh, breakfast to get you ready for what's to come. The next stop. Yes, I'm hiding in the shade. Now, if this is the first time that we're meeting, my name is Niels, and on this channel we go into the history, the mystery, and the beauty of Ireland for those people who would love to visit this gorgeous country. And that includes the Ring of Berra. What do you say, Kira? If they get some value out of this, should they give it a like? I like guess. <laughs> And here we are at stop number four, the Cashel Kilty Monument. And this is also where my camera ran out of batteries during the hike. Um, luckily, we did do a video in the past about this very hike. And I'll add that as a replacement footage of it here. So this is uh, an about one and a half hours total hike uh, through a beautiful forest and a mountain landscape up to remnants of two Bronze Age stone circles and a stone row. It's absolutely beautiful vistas over the Kenmare Bay and the McGillicuddy Reeks in the background. Now, you might say, really, another stone circle? Didn't we just visit one at Uruk? Yes, yes we did. But this hike is so beautiful and the end location has such good views that I'm just adding it on top of Uruk Stone Circle from earlier today. Now, honestly, if one stone circle is more than enough for you, Go with Uruk, skip this casual Kilty stop because it does take up quite a bit of your day. Like we said, about one and a half hours total. But if time and interest at all permit, do this stop, do this hike, you won't regret it. If you want to see the whole video that I mentioned of my best tips for this specific adventure, I'll leave a link in the description. And we keep on driving through the small town of Ardgroom. We've just passed the county border into Cork now. Barra is actually divided between counties Cork and Kerry. And past Ardgroom, we do a quick stop at Glenbeck Lake for a nice picnic after our long hike earlier. Here, we keep on driving past the car park onto the dead end road to a nice picnic table. Please do be careful on this very narrow road. After this great little picnic stop, we retrace our steps, we drive back through Outgroom and go to what I think is one of the best parts of the Ring of Berra, and that is the small stretch of land of what is sometimes called the Kilcatherine Peninsula. Here, there are four stops very close together, starting with the Kuas Pier Sea Caves. This is another of those well-kept secrets on the Ring of Berra. Careful with your steps here at the caves, it's very slippery. So to the right of the caves, there's a small path climbing up the hill, and this is the beginning of Pauline's Loop Hiking Trail. After about two minutes of a climb, you've got just the best views over some cliffs that you can really easily miss if you didn't know that it was there to begin with. It's a great little side trip to add for when you're at the caves. Now mind your step, there's no fences, just a sudden drop off. If you've got more than one day, Adding the full two-hour hike off Pauline's Loop is really worth it. It's rough, it's abandoned, it's just drop-dead gorgeous. You really feel Berra seeping into your bones, if you will, on this hike. It's again, it's if you've got more than one day. So all of these stops are really great, but the real gem here is the driving itself. The stops are really just focal points. More than the Kerry Peninsula, the Berra Peninsula has a roughness to it, a otherworldness and remoteness that is really hard to describe but can best be felt, uh, enjoyed as you drive through it. It's really my favorite part of Ireland and as you do these stops the best tip that I can give you here is to just enjoy that drive itself, pull over where you can and just soak in Berra's presence and like we mentioned consider staying longer than just that one day. That's enjoyable until now. Really fantastic drive. Stop number seven, we're in Kill Catherine Church and Graveyard, which is a beautiful little abandoned church and ruins. 
graveyard is still being used the location is just fantastic and one of the oldest surviving christian crosses in ireland can be found here and there is our beauty a lot of the graves surrounding it are far more modern but this one really dates back far into the deep history maybe even to the early christian period so that is the early medieval period uh, for ireland and when you're walking through these kinds of graveyards and there's quite a lot of them all over ireland it's almost impossible not to step on somebody's grave as you can see here there's a lot of little stones there that some of them are barely recognizable these grave sites have been used and reused over the centuries so just mind your step do the best that you can but sometimes it's almost impossible not to step on somebody's grave this is a must on your ring of barrow drive stop at kill catherine it's just so quiet so serene so beautiful you can really get the idea of how people lived here back in ancient times with these ruins and just how tightly knit that community would have been yeah kill catherine what a place our next stop is going to be just down the road maybe two minutes of a drive and that is the hag of Bera, a real celtic goddess petrified turned into stone still being revered here by the locals Now, as we're walking towards the remains of the Hag of Berra, let me tell you a little bit about her story and why she is such a cool thing to visit. There is no way that I can do justice to the kayak or Hag of Berra in just a few short sentences. She is such a central figure in Irish and Scottish mythology. Now, the barest of overviews, she's seen as the goddess of winter who controls the weather, the winds, and just how harsh the winter would be. She's much more than that. She's part of the Irish great goddess trinity, and like many Celtic goddesses, she is connected to the idea of sovereignty. The folklore has it that she would appear as an old woman to a knight or a hero, just wanting to be loved. And when she receives that love, she changes into a beautiful young maiden and sometimes bestows kingship or right to rule on the hero as a result. Now, the kayak goes through at least seven periods of youth and old age, seeing her husband die of old age seven times, and she is also inextricably connected to the Berra Peninsula. It's said that she's got about 50 foster children here. She's responsible for many geographical sites in the Irish landscape, with stones falling out of her apron, making mountains and cliffs along the way as she's passing through the landscape. And finally, she finds her last resting place here on Berra. Now, that story is really interesting. What we are walking towards now is said to be her petrified remains. The story goes that the local saint Catherine, yep, the one from church and graveyard fame, turned her to stone. The hag found the prayer book of the saint and ran off with it. Now, a local saw it, told the saint, who subsequently turned the hag to stone. Now here, obviously, you're seeing the pressure between the old ways and the new Christianity coming in. In my video that I did on Irish standing stones, we do mention that this is a returning theme of megaliths in the Irish landscape, where a local saint turns a Celtic god into a stone. And now here she still stands, looking out over the sea, waiting on her husband, the god of the sea, Manaman MacLear, to come back to her. And there she is. Locals still say that couples looking to get pregnant can visit her, give a little offering, and it will help their chances to get a, a child. And this is one of the coolest things. Offerings are still being left. Little tokens of appreciation, letting know that you've been here, or perhaps actual offerings. It's one of those things in Ireland where places of ritual, places that are ancient and connected to the landscape and to the old Celtic religions, are still being visited and are still being honored. How cool is that? Where else do you find that in Western Europe? As so I'm making my way back to the car, our next stop is going to be quite unique. It's going to be the highest Owen stone in the whole of Europe, Ballycrovan. Come take a look. So an Oam stone is a standing stone with ancient Irish writing on it called Oam. It's named after the Irish god Ogma, who is a warrior orator hero from the Tuatha who is seen as the Irish patron god of poetry, eloquence, and the inventor of Oam. 
Although there are many ideas about Ohm's origin, scholars nowadays prefer the theory that this earliest Irish writing system is actually an adaptation of the Latin alphabet. Traditionally, it's dated to about the 4th to the 9th century AD and is known as the Celtic tree alphabet. That means that each character is, has a corresponding tree. Now, we know it was originally also written on wood, but now only the stone versions survive. And on stone, the center line for the characters is usually the outer edge of the stone. Although later Scottish versions draw a line in the middle of the stone and use that as the center line. Our inscriptions are usually grave markers saying something like son of so-and-so. In the case of Baligrovan, it reads son of Daich, descendant of Torren. Ohm writing can be found all around the Irish Sea, with examples in Wales, in England, Scotland and the Isle of Men, but the vast, vast majority can be found in Ireland. And in Ireland, the vast majority can be found in Kerry and Cork. The Dingle Peninsula is absolutely littered with it, but the Ivora or Kerry Peninsula and the Barra Peninsula also have their fair share, with Ballygrovan being the tallest to my knowledge. Now the question of course always is, which came first, the writing or the stone? Meaning, was the stone erected originally to house the own writing on it? Or did our ancient chiseling friends use already existing Neolithic and Bronze Age standing stones to add their own inscriptions? Because stone is so hard to date, it's often impossible to tell unless you happen to have a C14 dating connected to the stone itself that puts it to the Bronze Age times. In that case, it's a dual function of a standing stone first and ohm stone later. To get to the Ohm Stone, you do have to go through private land. It is a national Irish monument, so you can definitely visit it, but it is proper form to ask the landowner's permission to enter on their land first. Really, that's the case anywhere in Ireland. Private land ownership is a big deal in Ireland, so it's always best to ask. The landowners are really nice people, but do ask. After the four close stops at Kua Sea Caves, Kilcatherine, the Hag of Berra and Ballygrovan, we drive through the colourful little town of Iris to our next two stops near Alahis, and that's Karakin Mass Rock and the final resting place of the children of Lear. Okay, I'm going to be honest with you guys. Uh, this is actually our second day. It turned out that our first recording session was so warm, we just had to go and run for shelter. It was just too warm to continue. Uh, we're not really used to that kind of weather here. So this is a couple of weeks later, we keep on going. Next stop is a mass rock between Iris and Alahis. So, mass rocks, what are they? Well, there's actually two waves of invaders from England that came to Ireland. The first one was under Henry II, and that's when it started, 12th to 13th century, and that invasion wave kind of failed. You could say that those people became more Irish than the Irish. It's an actual saying in Ireland. But that second wave was far more persistent. That was under the Tudors uh, in the early modern period, and they were far more harsh with putting down their boots uh, on the Irish. And one of the things that they did was make the Catholic religion uh, outlawed. Now, the Irish heard that and went like, yeah, sure, try and stop us. So what they did, they went out of the churches and into the countryside to the ancient places of worship uh, of their forefathers. So oftentimes places like a, um, a standing stone, stone circles, a holy well, they were used as a makeshift mass rock where the Catholics still came together to celebrate their mass away from the eyes of the English. We're gonna be visiting one right now. This one is, this one is gorgeous. Though the climb is only five minutes, it is steep. So just mind your step, take a walking stick along if you have it. Um, and hiking boots is also very smart. A bit of a longer video today, guys, but I hope that you're getting some inspiration out of it for your own drive. But definitely stick around till the end of the video, as our last stop strongly deviates from the normal ring of Barra Drive. We think you'll really be happy with following that choice if you only have one day. Want more inspiration for a beautiful Ireland trip? You can also find us on Instagram. Now, let's go to Alahis and the Children of Lear. So we're just outside of the small town of Alahis, and we're here at a 
little boulder with some offerings on top of it. Now, when you just pass this for the first time, you might not even notice it. It's that unassuming. But this is actually the supposed ancient burial place of the children of Lear. Now, if you've ever heard anything about ancient Irish stories, it's probably the children of Lear. Uh, the uh, ballet of the Swan Lake is actually based on the children of Lear, and it's one of those essential Irish stories that make up really a, a huge part of Irish identity, at least ancient Irish identity. So much so that in Dublin, the Park of Remembrance or the Statue of Remembrance is a statue of the children of Lear. So a really cool way to tie your whole trip to Ireland together is to visit this place first and then later as you visit Dublin to go past the Statue of Remembrance as well, coming full circle so to speak. It's just an extra little bonus tip there. Now I won't tell the whole story of the Children of Lear here, that's a story for another time and I'll definitely be doing a short video on that in the future. But the short summary is that King Lear had four children with his very first wife she dies and then Lear remarries and after a time that second wife becomes jealous of his deep love and devotion to those four children. Now she puts a spell on them and turns them into singing swans, cursed to just wander in different parts of Ireland for three times 300 years. Eventually after 900 years they get released from their curse by a Christian saint. He then baptizes them and that is just before they die of old age. Now note, the details, the places, the names of this story, they vary all over Ireland. For example, in some versions, the saint that releases and baptizes the swans is St. Patrick himself. In another version, it's a whole different saint altogether. Also, the final resting place is somewhat up for debate, and one of those places is here, Ombera. Like we said, it might not look like much, as you come closer, this boulder you can see it's just absolutely covered with seashells, with old coinage that actually with the oxidation just turned the, uh, the stone itself half red. It's, I think it's originally a white boulder, but it's starting to become a red boulder. And we're continuing our journey and our next stop is Killau Wedge 2. It's very easy to get to, it's right next to the road in a sheep's field, it's well signposted. So it's a very typical, albeit quite large wedge tomb for Southwest Ireland. I've not seen any specific dates connected to this one, but wedge tombs are usually dated to the early Bronze Age. So for Ireland, we're talking about 2500 to 2000 BC. And wedge tombs are actually seen as the last big megalithic tomb building projects for the island. So megalithic tombs in Ireland go through many different building styles, the most famous ones are, of course, the ones in the Boyne Valley, with the passage tombs of Newgrange, North and Douth. Now, those are quite a bit older, but it eventually ends with these wedge tombs. Now, like I said, this one is quite normal in its building structure for the area, but it does have some unique features with clear petroglyphs on the top and a hole bored into the side of the tomb as well. Kilau Wedge Tomb is also where we hop off the Ring of Berra and do another one of those detours. In this case, we're going right to the tippy top of the peninsula and visit the cable car that goes to Dursey Island. Now, technically, this is not on the Ring of Berra route, but it's a really easy, accessible, and extra quick stop that you can make. For today, we don't have enough time to actually go onto the cable car itself or visit Dursey Island, but the views over Dursey Sound are just great. If you've got more than one day, hiking on Dursey Island is really worth considering. Oh, and for those wondering, Tirnanog uh, is Irish for Land of Youth or Land of the Young, and it's basically the Celtic spiritual other world where the Tour de Danan now live. And apparently, you can get there with just a short swim from Dursey Sound. You gotta love that Irish humor. been a long day already and we still have to drive back so we are doing a quick coffee stop at the cafe of Jogson Berra Buddhist Meditation Center. The cafe and shop are open every day and the views over the Dingle Bay, the Atlantic Ocean and the Sheepheads Peninsula to the south, they are just forever.
this is a great opportunity to talk about our final stop and detour for the day, and that is Healy Pass. Going to Healy Pass makes our Ring of Barrow trip quite different than if you're following the normal route. Because we only have one day, we are bypassing a big stretch of the ring. So instead of going from Adrigol to Glengareth and then taking the car pass over the mountains, we instead are going over Healy Pass, and that's in the middle of the peninsula. And there's two reasons for this. One, although Kaha Pass is beautiful, the Healy Pass in our eyes is even better. And two, in this way we bypass a bit of an uninteresting part of the ring, and that is a stretch from Adrigol to Glengareth. Now, don't get me wrong, it's certainly not the worst part of Ireland, it still has some nice views. And Glengareth is absolutely great with Greenwich Island, Glengareth Nature Reserve, you've got Priest Leap and Barley Lake. But if you only have one day, then going over Healy Pass, in my mind, is the way to go. In this way, we also go over Lorik Pass later, which we bypassed earlier in the day when we took the coastal road. I said it before, and I'll say it again, you really need more than one day on Barrow. There's so, so many things that we didn't discuss. You've got Bear Island, you've got Garinish Island in Gardens, Artgroom Stone Circle, Bullrock Island, Alahi's Copper Mine Trail, you've got the Priest Leap, Kaha Pass, Molly Gallifants, Mare's Tail Waterfall, uh, Shron Biran, Don Boy Castle, Den of Scribes, the Bonan Valley. The list goes on and on and on. But we are going to leave it here for today on the top of Healy Pass. Now, if you like this type of content to get in the mood for your island visit, check out this video on what you absolutely need to bring for when you are coming to Ireland. And I'll see you all in the next video. Bye.